Um, but first of all, welcome uh, to the fifth, I believe, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneur conference that Watermark has put on. How many of you have been to one of these before? Okay, excellent, handful. How many of you, is this your first Watermark event? Awesome, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Um, for those of you who aren't that familiar with Watermark, Watermark is an org organization dedicated to helping women make their mark in and for their companies, primarily in leadership roles. And you're gonna get to see some of those women up from the stage today and in also the workshops that you're gonna see later on. Um, Watermark really focuses on three areas. One is to connect women to other women who can help them in their career, in their learning journey, um, and importantly, for their businesses. One, the second piece is to advocate on behalf of one another. And the third piece is to develop one another. And that's what the fun part of what today is. We get to sit in the audience and hear from extraordinary women um, and three men. <laughs> Just to make sure you're the only one here right now, so you're representing your kind. So this is good. Uh, extraordinary women and three men who are making their mark as entrepreneurs, as leaders, and frankly as advocates for other women. Um, you're going to hear an extraordinary who's who of people, including the former CEO and current chair of the board of Intuit, Bill Campbell. You're going to hear from the new president of the fastest growing hack of secondary education, Coursera. Have any of you checked out Coursera? Unbelievable, unbelievable. So the new CEO, um, and I apologize if she's in the room, I'm probably saying her name incorrectly, Lila Ibrahim will be with us today. You'll also hear from one of my personal heroes, and I'm thrilled to be able to meet her, serial entrepreneur and former CEO and co-founder of VMware, Diane Green. Um, and the current C COO, and I don't think she's here yet, she's probably stuck in that traffic as well, the current COO of my favorite company in the entire world right now. How many of you have experienced the joy of TaskRabbit? <laughs> Anyone else? Anybody? Come on. It's like having your own wife. It's the most amazing thing. <laughs> if you have not utilized TaskRabbit, I tell you, you need to do this. So we've got the current COO of um, probably one of the fastest growing companies in the country right now. So she's going to be here with us, Stacey Brown Philpot, um, as well as many others that you're going to have the opportunity to not only hear from their experiences, but also be able to chat, chit chat with them. And I encourage you, and I notice that you clearly are all amazing women because you were immediately introducing yourselves to each other and talking to one another about what we do. You will never have an opportunity in this kind of an intimate setting to talk to other women of this caliber. So I encourage you to talk to the people around you, talk to the people next to you, and engage with the people who you see on the stage, because this is your opportunity to do so. Um, so we're going to hear from those folks as well as many, many others. Um, and now I have the opportunity to introduce two, not one, but two of my personal heroes. Um, the first is Shelley Archambault, who's the CEO of MetricStream, and she is recognized internationally as one of the movers and shakers uh, in technology, winning every award that you can imagine. And literally, there are so many that I just got bored writing them all down. So, um, And not only has she won every award that you can think of, but she has also managed to increase the sales growth of MetricStream every year by 100% during her tenure. So <laughs> she's sitting here going, no wonder I'm tired. See? Um, not only does she do that and focus on running an extraordinarily large, successful company, but also, she also serves on many boards, including our own Watermark board, um, as well as the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and a little tiny company you may have heard of. It's kind of old school, AT&T. So please welcome to the stage, Shelley Archambault. Absolutely. Um, second, I'd like to introduce a, somebody who I consider a dear friend, um, as well as a colleague and a new rock star because she's here with a broken foot, having just flown in from Norway, like you do, last night. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to the co-founder of a, an organization that I know many of you have probably experienced yourself, Indiegogo. Danae co-founded Indiegogo in 2008, and the reason why she did it is she wanted to democ democratize, I always have such a hard time with that word, democratize fundraising to ensure that everybody could create the dreams that they had in their minds in reality. And she's done exactly that. She's now co-founder of the largest crowdfunding company in the world. Please welcome to the stage, Danae. As she slowly makes her way <laughs> to Two other things that I want to mention about Danae, and I apologize, I was just looking at my notes here. Two other things I wanted to mention about Danae. She was uh, noted as last year's Fast Company's top 50 women innovators, 
and this year's um, one of the 40 under 40, which I won't hold against her. So please, again, <laughs> Danae Rangelman. Oh, you might have to, did you turn it on? Oh, up at the top. Now it's on. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, great. So thank you very much for that wonderful um, introduction. I just have one small correction. It's actually Verizon, not AT&T. <laughs> 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 Keep learning. Keep learning. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, that, that's OK. That's OK. Well, now everybody will definitely remember. <laughs> Um, I am really excited to be able to spend the next um, 50, 60 minutes with all of you talking with Danae. Uh, we've had the opportunity to chat really just for the first time briefly today, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy hearing about both her story, um, what she's done, and you know what she plans to do. So let me start by asking a question that's on everybody's mind mm -hmm. now that you walked around the table to get in the chair. <laughs> How did you break your foot? <laughs> Um, not elegantly, uh, no. Um, I was actually on vacation, uh, taking the longest vacation I've taken since the beginning of Indiegogo, um, which was, I wait far too long for that, so that's my first piece of advice. But I was walking down a path, and that's it. I fell. <laughs> Nothing glamorous whatsoever. I may have been a little bit inebriated, maybe. <laughs> Well, it was vacation after all. It was vacation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, so first question, mm -hmm. right? For a lot of the women in the room, we have women who are currently running businesses. We have women who are thinking about starting businesses, um, folks who have maybe been in and out of it, done large, done small, et cetera, looking to learn. Where did you come up with the idea for Indiegogo? I mean, here you are. You basically opened up a whole new marketplace of crowdfunding, which yeah. never existed before. Yeah, um, it didn't come in one moment, I'll put it that way. Um, the, for me, the story, how I came to start Indiegogo uh, was a story that started when I was a young girl. And it clearly wasn't, um, I wasn't thinking about it back then. But um, what I mean by that was, what we're trying to do with Indiegogo is completely democratize access to capital, as Cindy said, uh, because Every day, every minute, <laughs> ideas go unborn, not for lack of heart or hustle from people all across the world, but lack of the right connection, lack of the right access to funding. Um, and so uh, we wanted to break down those barriers and literally put the power back in the hands of the people to decide which ideas came to life and let people be successful at raising money uh, based on how hard they're willing to work and how much the world cares. And those are the two, only two factors that we thought should matter. So that uh, belief that I still hold today is something that kind of I've come to realize I actually do believe over time. And the reason I believe that is because I did grow up here in San Francisco, actually. Uh, my parents were two small business owners. And they ran a brick and mortar business. And they ran it for 33 years. And uh, not once could they ever get any kind of outside capital. Um, and in, the, in our world, we mean, that means they bootstrapped for 33 years. And um, I just witnessed them you know, work their butts off every single day. And you know, dinner table conversations were about how to make payroll and should we refinance the house to get through 9-11, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, it just kind of made me mad that why, if you're willing to work so hard, why is it so hard to actually raise money when your business is doing fine and you have great customers, et cetera. So that was my naive take on the world when I was growing up. Um, and then I actually went into finance after college to understand um, how, how money really works and business um, works. And I was working on Wall Street, and I actually uh, had a pivotal experience happen that um, kind of amplified that uh, frustration I had had when I was a kid, which was I was invited to an event called Where Hollywood Meets Wall Street. And I was about 22 at the time, and this was 14 years ago now, or 16, no, I can't even do the math. I'm still in Norway time, <laughs> sorry. And, um, and, and I, actually I went because I remember it being a great excuse to get out of the office, and it's something I could justify to my boss because it had Wall Street in the title. <laughs> and, um, but really I was just super eager to learn what is it like to be a Hollywood financier, and what is it like to be, you know, 
um, a power broker and, and, and a Hollywood producer, and, et, et cetera. And I was working in the entertainment division at J.P. Morgan at the time. So um, I went, and it was <laughs> the exact opposite. Um, again, I was pretty naive and had all these expectations and realized it was actually just a sea of emerging artists hoping to meet their next angel. And because I was from a bank, that's what they thought I was. Um, and I, I spent the next two hours trying to explain to them that I crunch numbers, build spreadsheets. Um, I don't actually allocate capital, but um, <laughs> I wish I could, but maybe one day. Um, but that didn't really resonate with anybody. And it was two days later that a, an elderly filmmaker had literally spent, I remember, uh, about 15 or 20 bucks FedExing me his script um, and with a note that said, I look forward to financing my next film. And um, that's when my uh, heart broke because I knew he didn't have much money and he spent all this money just getting me the script. And um, I always like to say, I did what any young girl totally distraught does in that moment. I called my mom. <laughs> and. Um, I proceeded to cry for 30 minutes, talking about how unfair the world was, how America is not a land of all possibilities. We sell a, you know, we sell a lie. I went on this big philosophical tantrum, and my mother, who runs a brick and mortar business, <laughs> was like, "Well, if you're that pissed off about it, go do something about it." And she hung up on me. <laughs> um, I don't have time for this moaning, whatever. And so she says she doesn't remember that, but I do, because I sat there at my desk. It was like 8 PM. I was alone in the office. And it was this moment of like, OK, I'm going to go do something about it. So this is a long way of saying I started working with the filmmakers and theater producers. I actually ended up putting on, I teamed up with one of them. And we put on an Arthur Miller play called Incident at Vichy, which was a play about uh, racial profiling. This was right after September 11th. So I thought I could help him put on a one-night event where we got an audience there. I got investors there. We rented out a place. We got actors to volunteer their time to kind of put a quasi-show on with the goal of getting the investors to write that big check at the end. That's what you had to do back then to, to get a theater production financed. And I did all work for, worked for months. I almost got in trouble at work because Arthur Miller's agent was like faxing me stuff. And our compliance officer was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I was like, just something. <laughs> and um, anyways. Um, we ended up putting on the night, putting on the night, and it was amazing. The actors loved it. Richard Dreyfuss got involved. He wanted to be part of it. Um, the investors loved it, but um, the audience loved it. And then at the I thought the way it was going to work is I turned to the investors and they say, "I'm going to do it. I'll write the check." <laughs> Naive. Um, and they turned to me and they said, "That was amazing. We're not investing. Good luck." Um, classic. But. Um, that's the moment, though, that I actually real. If the elder, if my parents and the elderly filmmaker taught me that finance was broken, it was this experience that taught me how it was broken, and that was the power that was that the um, people who wanted this play to come to life the most, which in this case were the actors and the audience, they didn't actually have the power or mechanism to make it happen. They were completely reliant on the third-party gatekeepers whose interests were, in this case, not aligned. Um, and I didn't have the right pedigree, the right background, the right theater connections, the right, again, um, circle to make them take that leap of faith. And so um, I realized the way to fix it is to put the power back in the hands of the people to decide what gets fin financed and what doesn't and let them do it in aggregate. So um, I went back to business school with this idea actually to do an offline fund idea. It was a classic, uh, it was a classic fund model with a democratic twist, that was going to be my way to innovate. And um, quickly started pitching it to uh, everybody <laughs> under the sun. And uh, found my co-founder that way in the class. And he brought in our third co-founder, who then at that point said, well, if you really want to democratize finance, why aren't you using the internet? And I proceeded to give him a, a lesson in the 1933 and 1934 securities laws, <laughs> which he loved, <laughs> and um, said, I think it's a great idea. but." We, it would literally make us like, be illegal <laughs> to be investing online this way. And so then um, I said, but it's true. The internet is the most democratic platform and tool out there. And so we looked into figuring out if there's a way to automate regulations and all that stuff. And this was back in 2000. I should share this. this the play experience was like 2002. And finally, I quit and went back to business school in 2006. Met my co-founders then. and. Um, it was a lot of conversation about how we navigate. And we realized that we were trying to do two things. We were trying to both prove this concept of social fundraising, which the word crowdfunding didn't exist back then, and uh, 
change the law as three newbie entrepreneurs that have no track record whatsoever. <laughs> and we realized that was probably a little too optimistic. So uh, we put the equity piece on, on hold and we said, let's go prove social fundraising. Let's go use the internet to raise money more efficiently, helping people raise more money than otherwise possible. And do it in a way where it's the people that decide. And so that's when we created Indiegogo. We launched a beta, picking one vertical. We said, we'll take the Amazon approach. They took books. We, we picked film, because I had been working with a lot of filmmakers. And, um, and my colleagues, I should mention, they had their own front fundraising frustrations. Um, Slava had been working to raise money for, chair, for cancer research, because his father had died when he was a young boy. And my other co-founder, Eric, was um, prior to business school, had been working helping a theater company raise money in Chicago, and both not doing so great at it. <laughs> uh, so it was in all of our failure that we came together and decided to change things. So now we launched January 2008, and now we're the largest platform. And we're not just film. We exited our beta within a year um, to open up to all, to all ideas. And that's now the signature thing that continues to make us different. There's, I think, over 1,000 platforms now that have joined the industry. Um, but we're the only truly uh, ubiquitous, open, global platform that doesn't judge. So most of our competition uses more of a curation or application approach where they pick and choose projects for their site. Um, we fundamentally don't believe in that because that would go against our mission to democratize access to capital, and we'd end up becoming the gatekeeper ourselves if we let that happen. So we are hell-bent <laughs> on changing finance by creating an open ecosystem where all ideas have a chance to thrive and all ideas rise to the top on their own merit um, and no one else's. Right. That's it. <laughs> that was That's pretty amazing, isn't that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So if you think about, am I back on? So if you think about it, the time from idea <coughs> to the time that you actually got the company formed and started, how long was that? Do you start counting from when you were 10? <laughs> or do you start counting from when you actually went to business school? I, I kind of, for myself, I think I start counting when, I, when I, I had heard myself pitch this idea while I was working in finance to my J.P. Morgan colleagues probably one too many times. And I was like, I'm so sick of hearing myself talk about this. I need to just like go do it. Um, so that was probably 2005, 2006. And the moment I quit, uh, which was a very scary moment because I had also seen myself as the financial safety net for my family, um, knowing that my parents, you know, they were still running their business, trying to make it work. Um, that was kind of my personal mission and goal was to be the safety net for my family, and I was putting all of that at risk by leaving corporate finance, which was, you know, fast track to nice money, and um, try to go do this. But um, I, I. Uh, Talk a little bit about that, Danae, because yeah. for many people, and probably even in this room, the whole gut-wrenching decision of, do I leave a salary that shows up twice a month like clockwork, right, mm -hmm. so I can pay my mortgage or pay my bills, do I put that aside and jump into the pool where I won't know where my next dollar is going to come from for some period of time, right, yeah. while I build this up? It's not a simple thing. No. I think the audience would love to hear, so how did, how did you think about that? Yeah. Well, I, I knew I wanted to be my own boss for a long time. Um, I didn't know what that was. I was pre-med in college because I liked helping people in science, so I thought medicine. And um, I, but I knew that I'd, I'd potentially maybe run my own medical practice or when I got into finance, I was like, maybe I'll be a financial planner and work for myself. I always knew that. And the reason I wanted to do that was because I saw my parents never miss a basketball game, never miss a piano recital. They were always there. And all my other friends' parents who um, had to miss because they had other obligations for their job. And so that was my naive interpretation of the only way to have work-life balance is to start your own company. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, but the... The, I know, irony. Oh. Um, the, 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 the moment, though, it was hard. Well, so because of that, though, I, while a lot of my friends in finance, I worked in finance for about six or seven years, while a lot of my friends kept getting bigger apartments and spending more money, I just tucked more and more money away. And so I actually sat. I, that was one of the things finance did give me, was this nest egg that I could, of savings, um, that I then, thought I would need only, f I thought it would take a year 
<laughs> to uh, you know get the company going and then start paying myself again. It ended up taking four. So um, I ended up living at home with my mom and my dad. <laughs> um, anyways, but it um, the moment of yes, I was afraid to quit because there was that stability and that risk really putting my family at risk. I knew I'd probably find another job and be able to sustain myself, but finance for me was also this great way to make a lot of money to, to help my family. And so I realized though that I was getting up every day and I, my heart was not there. I wanted to think about this idea far more than turning out another equity research report on the latest you know, uh, move in cable pricing, um, which is where I was right before I quit. So I think there was at one point we launched coverage on News Corp and the whole video game industry and which took months of, of that. Um, by this point, I was in equity research. And I think at the end of that, I realized I don't give a crap about video games. <laughs> and actually, they're hurting kids. So why do I, you know, I had like a lot of these kind of moments of what do I believe? Mm -hmm. And I think it was just a, a, a moment of, you know, at the time I have to do this or else I actually don't think I'll do that well in finance if I keep along this track because my heart's not there. And we all know that you, if you, if you do what you love and you do what you're good at, you will make more, the money will follow. And I know that's a little bit of a pipe dream we sell. You have to be a little bit more responsible than that and just trust that it'll all happen. But um, I just realized I, w I didn't love what I was doing. And that then started, me, started to make me question, am I actually really good at this? I don't even know. I don't even care if I'm that good at it. So then it became a question like, well, I'm clearly not gonna be able to be that financial pillar anyways. So I actually don't have a choice. I have to quit um, and and do that. So the moment though I quit though, I thought I was going to be, uh, I, I thought I was going to have what is it like? You know, there's buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. I was going to have quitter's remorse. Um, but I, it was the exact opposite. I quit. I actually got on a plane to go to um, uh, Costa Rica to go to surf camp for a week, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I was applying to business school at the same time, and I hadn't slept for like a week doing finishing my applications. And literally, when I quit and I got on that plane, I, maybe I was delusional because I hadn't slept. And I also sat next to a man who had a severe ADHD, and we were watching A Beautiful Mind. So like, it was like this like weird. It was like where, what world am I in like right now? But I never felt so light mm -hmm. and so free. And so the world is my oyster, and I can go make it happen. And no one's telling me not to do any, like no one is telling me anything anymore. It's like just me. And so that, I didn't expect that sense of liberation. Um, and thank goodness for it because that gave me then the confidence to just go for it. And I use business school. Maybe that's how I uh, justified it in my logical brain. Um, I'll use business school and if it totally fails, at least I'll have an MBA and I can go do something and have a great story. Um, Cause we always are trying to like uh, justify our risk, right? So um, that was my, that was the logical story I sold myself. Um, but yeah, I ended up, it was this, I just remember feeling so light and unburdened. And, uh, and then we started Indiegogo. It hasn't always been light <laughs> or unburdened, but um, it's definitely, I've woken up every day and not questioned why, why I'm going to work. Yeah. What were some of the um, surprising challenges? So here you are. Now business school, you've got your partners together, you guys have started to, you've built out your business plan and you're starting to execute, et cetera, mm -hmm. based upon what you thought mm -hmm. when you quit your job and got on the plane to go to surf school. <laughs> uh, what, were, what were some of the initial surprises? Well, the first surprise was how long it was taking for the world to understand what we were trying to do. <laughs> Why does the world get it? Um, I mean, we didn't have language. We didn't have the word. We didn't have an industry called crowdfunding. Um, we, and I think I learned this in a customer development class with Steve Blank at, at business school, which is when you're starting a new company and you're creating a new industry, all of your marketing is education. And um, I didn't realize how hard education was going to be. And it starts with you know hitting the streets one by one and then trying to figure out what are the more scalable ways to actually educate. But um, I think it took us, our goal was to launch January 2008 and raise venture funding fall 2008, um, which clearly didn't happen. Uh, we didn't raise our first seed round till March 2011. 
Um, and so we went much longer and a lot of that was because we just didn't have the traction, the data. We didn't have the numbers to show that we, that it was working in a robust manner until that time. And so I mean, we didn't have the data because it wasn't working <laughs> in a robust manner until that time because the world didn't understand yet. So we had to do a lot of heavy lifting around helping our customers raise money this way and learning from them and replicating their success and the drivers of their success and trying to help. And it's just your classic, when you start a marketplace, you have two sides, um, two customers essentially. And so I always like to say the hardest thing about starting a marketplace is starting it. <laughs> but once you get the traction, the momentum, it's a much easier to make, it's still hard, but it's um, a lot easier to maintain it and iterate off of it. In a crowd, oriented business, mm -hmm. how do you listen to your customers? So obviously, I'm sure from the time that you launched or put together a plan versus what you're doing now, you've tweaked your offering, you've expanded, you've done a number of things. Mm -hmm. um, you can't necessarily do a small user group <laughs> kind of thing, right, and get some feedback from your customers. So how do you get feedback from the marketplace to know what you need to do? That's a great question. Um, we have had uh, our primary uh, way to do this is um, we created a customer happiness effort uh, from the beginning and we called it customer happiness for a reason not customer service uh, because our goal was to make people successful at raising money and when you're successful you're happy so that means the job of the customer happiness person which when we started was me <laughs> um, is to make people successful and so part of that then is the education component um, but it's also to understand what's not working and so and as well as to answer questions and do the service part And so the way we've approached it is we've used customer happiness as our eyes um, Eyes on the ground with our customers and um, We're continually iterating on that on um, we actually just moved customer happiness into our product team uh, for that specific reason um, where they're not there just to help customers, but they're there also as the feedback channel to our product team to, to ensure that we're actually building things that people want. Um, we actually also have, uh, because it's been a new industry, it's a new industry, and because we're an open platform, we're literally in every country and every industry, and you have everybody from, you know, uh, people raising money for home security devices to couples raising money to have a baby on Indiegogo. So the use cases are couldn't be more different and um, but there are similarities between those two experiences and then there's a lot of differences and so we've had a team on the ground developing all the different industry or all the different um, industries as well as geographies we're starting to build that out now too and so their job is to get more people to run campaigns and so any kind of friction or headwind that they run into um, around whether it's a product that's not working right etc again feedback right to the, pro to the product team um, so there's a lot. There are a lot of input channels um, coming in, but it's 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 all about training people to really listen to the customer really well and have empathy. Um, so, no, ex excellent points. And I want to actually take some time and open it up for the audience to ask questions because part of the opportunity of having Danae here is for each of you to be able to get your questions answered about how to do this. But while you're thinking about your question, I have a question for the audience. Does anyone know, Kauffman Foundation did a study last year to look at the number of companies that are started, startups, startups that are created by women. So 2013 Kauffman study, the percentage of startups that are created by women. Anybody have idea what percent? Startups. No, 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 no. Startups, you're going to be amazed, guys. It's three, oh, no. three, and I think the way they were defining startups, right, and that's what we have to come to, is getting, it taking external funding, oh, all right, yeah. so not just internal. There you go. Money your, your yourself, but getting externally funded, three percent, three percent. So I say that only to say the reason we're doing the conference and bringing fabulous people here is this is a chance to learn so we can figure out how we actually grow those numbers. So, before I ask any more of my questions, are there any questions out there in the audience? And perhaps. Well, can I say something oh, about please that? Please do. I mean, While you're thinking. It's, definitely, um, it's definitely frustrating that because I know there's more women starting businesses out there that deserve VC funding. Mm -hmm. um, and 
one thing, one, one stat I'm incredibly proud of is that when you, when you create an open funding platform like we've done, where we don't decide who's on our site, we let anybody come on as long as it's legal. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found is actually 48% uh, of all campaigns that reach their funding target are run by women. All right. And of the entrepreneurial specific campaigns, it's 42. So it's clearly better than three. Yeah. Um, and I just think that just speaks to when you actually make success uh, contingent solely on how hard you're willing to work and how much audience you have, like how much the mar market there is, a uh, proven market, then um, women do just as well as men. Mm -hmm. And you remove all those biases, whatever the biases are, whether they're pipeline issue biases or investor biases, doesn't even matter anymore. It's a moot point. <laughs> um, just bypass all of that. Very cool. Question. Because we're recording. But what happens is we talk ourselves out of it. Mm -hmm. Men talk, men have more of the approach of, well, why not? We'll try it. Mm -hmm. Women are, what if? <laughs> what if this happens? Mm -hmm. So we have all the ideas. We just don't execute on them because we lose the courage. And I thought that was really an interesting point that's relevant to what you're talking yeah. about. Hi, um, I have a quick question about business school mm -hmm. in regards to startup. So um, do you mind telling us what school you went to? Sure, Haas. Okay. So, so, okay. Sorry, so I know we're in two, So I have two questions. Part. So I have two questions in regards to that. So one question <sighs> is, do you think that it matters, like should you go to the most prestigious school that you can get into in terms of business school in – in regards to an entrepreneurial startup. And second question is, um, do you think it affects your ability to get funding, to have not just an MBA, but an MBA from a particular school? Well, my... Go ahead. Uh, Go so, first of all, I think, uh, for me, the MBA was helpful because it gave me two years of kind of experimentation. And, uh, it gave, and it surrounded me with uh, teachers and stu really smart teachers, really smart students whose sole goal was to help us, <laughs> right? There's no other agenda. And so for me, that's why business school is so amazing. I think I, I hear a lot, I remember I was on the phone with a young woman who was thinking about going to business school because, she, or she was going to business school, she really wanted to start a company. She was asking me, should I get an internship at a startup so I have uh, experience to like launch and I said honey you're starting a business you're hiring yourself you don't need to prove anything to anybody <laughs> like some resume and all you need I actually I encouraged her I'm like I actually think you should use business school to start the company because you're gonna mess up and it's gonna you're gonna be at a doing a different we were a different business by the time we came out of it um, and so why wait and no one's gonna teach you more about entrepreneurship than entrepreneurship yourself and just do it in a really rich environment. So that's what the MBA was for me. It was a really rich environment to get feedback and test things out versus it's not going to, quote, give you any kind of blueprint to starting a company. Um, it'll give you frameworks and ways to look at things, but no one's going to do it for you. Um, so you just got to go go do it. It's my, and what about the funding? Do you think it gave you credibility? Um, it gave me access, for sure. But again, it's... It's a little ironic in that we're a business trying to eliminate the need for access. Um, but, it, well, in the end, it, I don't see us replacing the venture capital industry. I see us working side by side. We're creating this incubation platform for ideas to rise to the top in a merit-based fashion. We're actually increasing their pipeline and their deal flow. Um, and then they're getting more ideas, better ideas, and then sourcing them through more merit-based fashion versus relying just on their networks. Um, because that's where the inefficiency happened, and through inefficiency is where unfairness starts, and that's where the biases come in, and that's why you see 3% numbers. Yeah, and if I could just add, the other thing that you get in terms of going to a, a Haas or a Stanford or, or whatever you, is yes, the name, but it's also experience. You're talking to professors 
who have actually been working with entrepreneurs. They see the patterns, right? They, so there's a lot to learn from that experience versus going to a school to get an MBA where they actually don't have much in the way of entrepreneurial experience. Mm -hmm. MBA by itself, you know, an MBA is an MBA, but they're all different in terms of where they're focused. If you're focused on building a company, you want to go someplace where other people who are focused on building companies mm -hmm. go because you get that network effect and where professors and the advisory group that's way beyond the university, right, have that experience to be able to share with you. Yeah. 10% of our, my class at Berkeley were starting companies by the time we graduated. It was, I think we, it was crazy. My friends at Harvard were jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our 20-year-old daughter just got back from college last night, and we had sent her off down the path to law school, but she came back last night and said, I really want to be a writer, and I'm going to write the great American novel. So I'm thinking of your mom, who you talked to and you know had the meltdown, and who said, if you're that passionate about something, go do it. But it's a scary thing to do. I mean, if my daughter turns out like you in her field, more power to her. <laughs> but the mom in me says, no, no, go get the law school degree, mm. you know, and have the insurance, and write the novel on the side, because not everyone's J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any sort of perspective what is your on the parent, you know, the mm -hmm. parental role in sort of encouraging the unfettered <laughs> experimentation <laughs> versus... <laughs> well, I can call my mom and see what she says. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me take this one. Um, having kids in their 20s, right, as well. Biggest thing is they are going to be working for so many years. Kid, our children are going to live well into their hundreds, right? I mean, they are. They are, because we are. So they absolutely are. They have plenty of time to experience, to try things the whole bit. My view is they have something passionate about it, and whether it's writing or it's teaching or it's figuring out how to create the best art you know, on the wall, let them go try it. They have another 60, 70 years to work to go <laughs> make them support themselves. Yeah. But that's just a Shelley Archambault. <laughs> but I also do agree. Like, if I, I honestly think if I had stayed in finance, I wouldn't have been so successful because I would have been fighting myself every day. And so the question for you, I would say, is what is she at, really try to help her discover what she's really passionate about? And it's not a looking, it's not a looking for exercise outside of herself. It's a we were talking about this before. It's a noticing exercise. Notice what bothers you about the world. Notice what gets you excited about the world. And if she can't keep her mind off of writing a book, go write the book. Like because then she'll be, she's, her energy's there, she's passionate about it, she'll put everything she's got into it, and the chance of it being successful is so much higher than if she were going doing something else that she doesn't care about, she's fighting herself with every day. Um, I do believe that she just won't be as successful. Her chance of being successful will just be less, and so then you're playing an odds game. Yeah. Other questions? I see yeah, there's, I, there's one here too. Okay. Oh. Um, quick question. You had mentioned earlier in your journey that um, that when you were first starting your company, there was the piece just doing the crowdfunding, and then uh, the other piece was changing the law. And mm. so I was wondering, what was what did you come up against, and were you able to change the law? Um, yeah. So we, it's in interesting. So I remember saying, we'll figure out changing the law five, ten years from now, and I had no idea what that really would entail. Um, it actually. So what we ended up doing was we we started Indiegogo with the basically. Um, using a, an open model where you raise money and off in exchange for perks, and the only th and the perk was anything that the person raising the money wanted to offer, and that's still the way it is today. The only thing they couldn't offer was any kind of profit participation or upside, because that would be deemed a security and therefore illegal. Um, and so that was the only thing we couldn't allow. But if you wanted to raise a hundred thousand dollars to open a restaurant, you could offer a thank you note for five bucks. For a hundred bucks, you can offer you know, $200 worth of food when you when the restaurant actually opens, so use it kind of as a pre-sell type thing. Anyways, within two years though, or actually within, I guess, three years, we finally started making traction, and we had teamed up with Startup America, which was President Obama's initiative. I do think there was a couple trends that did help us. One was the financial crash, with all the banks tightening up. Finally, people were open to looking at alternative forms of finance, so that's when we started getting some coverage. Um, and then, um, and then with President Obama being very uh, forward-thinking around entrepreneurship as a great uh, job stimulator and economy stim stimulator, based on data from the Kauffman Foundation, etc., um, they put through Startup America, which was an initiative to inspire more entrepreneurs. And we became the only sub-billion-dollar company on the launch partner list. So it had like Intuit and Facebook, and then there was Indiegogo. <laughs> um, 
And that's a testament to my co-founder who hustled his way to find the guy who runs it and pitched him like on the fly, et cetera. So we got in there. And um, so anyways, that put us on the radar of the White House. And so then the next move for the Obama administration um, was what kind of legislation, what is le what legislation is there that's holding our economy back? And um, they saw that crowdfunding was actually an incredible stimulator. We had a, a young woman who had started a bakery business who, um, she just didn't want to get a job, and she just loved baking, gluten-free, and she started her own business and got a loan to do it and was doing so well within nine months, she had the opportunity to sell her gluten-free macaroons in a local grocery store chain, and uh, she went back to the bank because she needed another $15,000 of working capital to redo the packaging to make it happen, because when you're 10 months old, you don't have 15 grand <laughs> of cash sitting on the side, and the bank said, congratulations, sorry, not going to lend it to you, too high risk. Um, similar to the play. And so she said, screw that. I don't want to let this growth opportunity go by the wayside. So she went to Indiegogo and said, and went to her customers and said, and offered macaroons as perks and raised the $15,000. Her customers were like, this is awesome. And they shared it. So she actually built her customer base. It became a marketing engine for her. Um, and then within a month, she had done her packaging. Within six months, she had uh, distributed her macaroons across 40 states across America and hired, started hiring people. And so she became like this poster child for the Jobs Act. Um, she was actually up on stage with President Obama when he signed it. So it actually got, it was, what was remarkable is that um, I had actually done a campaign on Indiegogo called Crowdfunding Campaign to Change Crowdfunding Law. Very meta because I was a customer of my own platform and I was trying to change the own law that governed my own platform. Anyways. Um, but it was fun because we raised thousand dollars to kind of get, got, build awareness. We paid a lawyer to write a petition to the SEC to change the law because we thought things like the SEC laws were great in protecting people, but the way they protected it, people from losing their entire investment back in the 30s was just not allow them to invest. Um, and so you have these sophisticated investor laws, et cetera. Um, but another way to protect people from losing their entire net worth if they're not sophisticated is just limit how much they can do it. You couldn't do that efficiently without technology in the 30s, so now you could. So we we're trying to get the law to change that way. And so that was the seed that started in 2010. That I, so I used my own platform to kind of get the message going. Um, and then we, there was a, f a few lobbyists, uh, startup exemption guys, who kind of took it and pushed the whole thing forward. And we just sent case studies but upon case studies. And it happened within a year, and I think it got like 92% bipartisan support. It was like Democrats loved it because uh, it was giving like little people opportunity um, to invest in things. Republicans loved it because it helped small businesses get going. <laughs> it was like this love fest across the aisle. And like I didn't know anything about these things. Probably the only one. <laughs> probably, probably the only one. Yeah. So anyways. Great. Other questions over here? Oh, cool. It's so exciting. We logged on every day. We were <laughs> counting it. She she almost doubled the uh, target amount. Um, the process was really cool. The people could see what she's doing. It was for uh, coming out with an EP. She's a senior at USC, a music major. So yes. compliments all around. Awesome. It was very, very That's, exciting. I love those. Stories. I love the name. How oh. did you come up with the name? So uh, that goes to my co-founder, Eric. Uh, he was our founding CTO, um, the tech, technical guy. Um, and we, we had had a project name um, because we didn't have a name yet. And it was such a terrible project name that people were uh, misremembering it with um, bad, bad words. Um, <laughs> it was so bad. It was just so bad. And I think we were going to a conference and needed, just needed a name. We just needed a goddamn name. <laughs> and, um, and we need to get rid of this project name. And anyways, and so he was riding his bike to, to class one day in business school. And we knew we wanted a name that kind of celebrated the independent spirit. And we really wanted an active word because this isn't like put up an idea, walk away and watch the money show up. This is about activating your community. It's about no, like doing your marketing, your market engagement, getting feedback, and raising money all at once. Um, so this is not a, a passive experience. And so he was thinking about the club Whiskey A Go Go in uh, LA, which was very hip and happening. And uh, but so he put the word independent in, together with it. And so he came up with Indiegogo, and he shared it with us. I thought it was awful. Um, 
<laughs> because not for because I didn't like it, but because I'm like I think of go-go dancers, and I think we're trying to do more than that right now. Um, <laughs> but even though there's go-go dancers that use Indiegogo to raise money, which is awesome. Um, but then we we just crowd checked it. Like so, I everybody from my I'd like to say my mother to my hipster little brother liked it. So if those two people can agree. Um, <laughs> My mom, yeah. So people just said, "Oh, it's oh, it's active. It's all about going." And I'm like, "Yeah." So, and I like to say it's. it's I love the the double go because um, it's about someone with an idea and going for it and putting it out there, and then it's about the world confirming that and going to and saying, "Yes, we want this to happen." It takes two to tango. Yep. I have uh, one other question. Uh, what? How, how do you monetize? Uh, what's your monetization model? Percentage of funds raised. And we have two funding um, frameworks. So we have fixed funding and flex funding. Uh, fixed funding is you set a funding target. You run a campaign for a finite period of time. You set a funding target. You only get your money if you reach your target. And under flexible funding, um, you get your money whether or not you reach your target. But we give you an incentive to reach your target because um, in both cases, when you reach your target, we take 4% of the funds raised. And in the fixed case, when you don't reach your target, the money goes back. There's no fees. No money changes hands, but in flex, if you don't reach your target, it's 9%. Um, and so we actually A-B tested that and found that it helped more people reach their goals more and set more realistic goals, so actually helped people. Um, and we didn't, But we didn't want to penalize them completely by not getting anything by just having the fixed model. There's one over yep, right there. Hi. Um, you mentioned that and you, you had all of your goals set for 2008 for your funding, and it later came in 2011 because you didn't have the data. Mm -hmm. So there was a long time where, you know, how did you know that you were looking at the right data and that it was really a matter of time? So what advice do you have for everyone here of how do you keep the faith in the middle of all of it? That was really hard. Um, we, my, Eric also has a great quote. We, one of our first employees asked us, um, probably in 2011 or 2012, she said, um, so why did you guys just not give up? <laughs> because, um, and he said, well, I, we were passionate about what we were doing despite reason. So I think, um, I think there was both advantages and disadvantages to being newbie entrepreneurs. Uh, the advantages were we just didn't know how slow it, of growth we were doing. It was always going up and to the right. We just didn't know what hockey stick was until like a year or two into it. And that, I remember one month we doubled out of nowhere. And I was like, oh, that's hockey stick. And then doubled again, and, doubled, and I was like, I'm glad I didn't know that three months ago, or like a year ago. Um, so the disadvantage is that, you know, we were newbie, entrepreneurs naive we probably weren't looking at the right data we were probably not focused on the right thing because we were trying to figure it out and so it took us maybe a little bit longer but um, in the end what we focused on was the fact that we kept getting one customer after another customer after another customer and listening to them and they kept saying this is changing this has changed my life this has changed the way I finance my business this has changed the way I finance my film this is going to change how I'm going to move going forward and we kept listening to that, and that was the confidence that we knew we needed, that we were on something real, that we were fixing something that was truly broken. Um, and then it became a Then it just became an awareness game. We just had to let people, more people know that this is possible. And that's why I say in the beginning it was all education. Marketing was all education, what's possible, um, because it's not like we were a cheaper, better, faster way of doing something. We were a completely new way of doing something. And so even in the process, I think what kept us going through was that we were so, all of us, the three of us were so, um, like, a lot of advice I give other entrepreneurs is you go, to, you go to a lot of conferences that talk a lot about the how and the what. Um, you learn about A-B testing, you learn about lean startup method, all, all that stuff is great, but you forget, they forget to teach you about the why, which is making sure that the problem you're solving is something you truly passionately care about because that's what gets you through the hard times when maybe the numbers don't justify it and the logic doesn't really justify it. Um, that's what will get your daughter through writing a book when it's taking her three times as long as she thought. Um, but it has to be genuine, pa authentic passion about the problem you're solving. And, um, and honest, and it's, it's basically being married to, to the problem but not the solution because your solution, figuring out how you're solving that will change over time. And I think that also allowed us to not get 
I mean, it allowed me to, like, not, I had been working on the offline fund idea for several years in my head, talking to people, and then we pivoted to the online approach kind of over, overnight, and I think I was able to do that because I didn't care so much about how I was solving it, I just cared about solving it. And if I can just, just add on the perseverance piece, when you talk to some of the smartest and wisest people in building of businesses, whether it's a Vinod Kosla or a Bill Campbell or whatever, what they will tell you is perseverance is half the battle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and it's hard. So what she's saying is, ab is absolutely right. We're gonna take, how are we, do we're getting close on time, right? Okay, so last question, then we'll do a wrap up. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm remembering something that happened years ago when uh, the dot and dot com was sung. In those days, uh, I, I worked for the startup company, Webcash. It was a precursor to what we today have as PayPal. Mm. And uh, one of the things, that it was a very exciting time. We did have a great product built. Those were the days when we didn't know how to bring merchants online. And we were the ones who provided that. So it was very exciting for us. But what happened with the company was after a couple of years, when it, it, it rode high, uh, it fell flat uh, because it couldn't go to the uh, highest level of funding uh, because there were too many small-time investors, hmm. too many of them. It was a big crowd in those days. And what I recall is that destroyed the company totally. We had to file for bankruptcy. We couldn't sell it out, and the owners did not make any money. All the investors lost in it, and employees like me who were looking at it with a lot of hope, we lost too in that. So is that something that you see with uh, businesses that come uh, that secure funding through your site? Do you think after a certain point, are they going to be poised for continuing success, or is there a danger? Well, on Indiegogo right now, there isn't, the people who are funding it are not actually getting ownership. So what we're seeing is we're seeing people who use it, who are using the platform to, um, like nonprofits and charities are using it to raise money in a, in a new way. We're seeing um, businesses raise money um, more as like a, a pre-sell kind of, it's not really a sell, but it's, um, you're trying to raise money for a new, you know, activity tracker. We had, um, you know, many people do different kind of uh, devices, um, and so they offer the actual product as a way, uh, as a perk. So you're kind of getting the money up front. So you're actually mitigating your overproduction and underproduction risk, and completely eliminating your working capital risk, because you're getting the money up front, going and making the product, and then delivering versus borrowing from a bank or a venture, going and making the stuff and hoping you can sell it. You're kind of reversing that whole thing, um, but it's not an actual ownership that people are, are getting now. Um, and so you don't run into the problem of um, too many owners um, of a product. Though what we're seeing though is people using Indiegogo as a way to step to, to attract that venture capital. It's been a great way for people who are locked out of traditional finance, like the bakery owner that I talked about, as well as people who aren't ready for traditional finance. And this gets them ready because it reduces their execution risk, their market risk, um, and clearly their, clearly their financing risk all in one uh, swoop. And so we're seeing venture investors who get pitched a lot for businesses um, to invest. They say, you know what, I love your idea, sounds awesome, but I don't know if there's a market there. I don't know if you guys can actually pull it off. Why don't you go run an Indiegogo campaign, raise a million or two million bucks, prove that you have a market, prove that you can get your ducks in a row and your marketing message and all that lined up. Um, so that you know where your audience is and your customers are, and then come back. And so what we're seeing, that's how I see us working again with the traditional finance. And that, that, at that point, though, um, the JOBS Act has passed. Equity crowdfunding will become permitted soon. Um, and what that will enable is people to take to do in small chunks investments into these companies using Indiegogo and other platforms um, if we actually go move forward with that. But it's... Um, that question will have to be figured out. That's that's a room. That's a point of innovation that will have to happen because we know that there it, there's plenty of stories like yours where there's so many investors, so many cooks in the kitchen, you can't get anything done. And so I think it'll be on the platforms that do equity crowdfunding to f to mitigate against that risk and figure out what the right um, use, user experience essentially is to not let that happen. Great. Well, listen, Danae, thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for your time. Thanks, well, guys.